you know. Night, Pop. Love ya. Um, let's see. There we go. Amazing.
What I should do on this drone is 
put a spiral on your jaw. That was really fucking cool. Spiral down here. Yes. Let that dry.
doesn't need to take this long and do it like that. Okay, so, so far. No, no. It's gonna be black and white. Come down here. Yeah. That's bad. Lines right here, spiral here. Back there. This is gonna be fucking moving when I'm done with it. <laughs> okay, so black, what do I black?
So in essence, this microphone. And the spiral continues right here. Okay. Holy shit, that looks good. <laughs> I love it. I fucking love this.
Okay, so that here is white, so this one's gonna be black.
Alright, I need some noise in here. It's too damn quiet. Let's see. Getting outside this winter starts here. Lightweight fabric keeps you warm, not hot. The only saving grace was that I didn't have an adequate time to process my grief. If I had, it may have completely gotten the better of me. But in a matter of seconds, we were on the move. We put out the fires, covered the body. I went into the lobby to find Wolfgang standing there. Waiting. He looked us up and down and asked, What happened? He tried to keep it covered with his jacket, but I noticed the gun in his waistband immediately. Where were you? Lauren asked. I don't know. You are. A coughing fit got the better of Claire. She fell into the corner. Trying to catch her breath instead of rushing to her sister's side, Lauren turned to me. I knew it was coming and didn't particularly care for it. Save it, I said. I'm fine. Of course I wasn't. Okay. The time was of the essence, and the last thing I wanted to hear was her reciting the same platitudes that Tobias was giving Wolfgang only minutes earlier, after his mother had died. When the sneaky little shit took advantage of our distraction and stole the gun, the words would have rang just as hollow now as they had then. Wolfgang came to the bottom of the stairs, took a look at the damage in the room behind us, and asked, Is there anyone else left? What he meant was, Is there anyone else left alive? Anyone else to worry about stopping me? So he was too inexperienced and subtle. Even without Claire's ability to amplify my senses, I would have known. Nathaniel may have been dead. As long as Wolfgang was armed, we weren't out of the woods yet. I went for the safe answer. We don't know. There's probably more people here. He pointed at the destruction. The wall was in there. He stepped closer. His hand gravitated uncomfortably close to the hidden weapon. We don't know. Wolfgang cocked his head at me, no doubt wondering if I suspected him. How could he ever have guessed that I knew exactly what he was thinking? I still didn't understand myself. These thoughts appeared randomly in my mind. It's been a while since I took my medicine. What are we gonna do now? He asked. I have a plan, I answered. Then, on the fly, I made up a plan. We need to split up. The girls will stay here and search for survivors. You and I will go get my car and bring it around. I thought you said your car broke down. It did. I have everything I need to fix it now. That's it. Tell me whatever you need to, just get him away from the others. Lauren put her hand on my shoulder and said, Jack, I turned to face her. This is the best idea. Then I looked past her to Claire. Isn't that right? Claire nodded in agreement. That was enough for Lauren. Be careful, Claire said without moving her lips or using her voice. I turned back to Wolfgang. Let's go. We don't have much time. Flashed a grin. After you. The rain was chilling to the bone. We were both drenched in no time. Stinging winds and water lit up every fresh burn on my face and hands. The storm quickly washed the blood and bits from my hair. The solid pieces, I realized, were disgust with switches of bone fragments. I wanted to puke, but I held myself back. I needed to keep my wits about me and watch for the right opportunity to turn the tables. But Wolfgang was patient and calculating. Followed closely, never coming within arm's reach. We used our phone flashlights to cut through the dark. If I got lucky, my baseball bat might save the day, but as we continued, I became aware of certain curious matters. There seemed to be far more trees than I remember seeing on our walk up here. The road felt much thinner. Where we walked might be barely considered enough space for a one way, and our walk didn't include any sort of decline. Aren't we supposed to be going downhill? 
I shine my light at the nearest tree. I love For this. a moment, it looked like something had scared me. Just, whatever it might have been was the least of our concerns. We were nearly a mile into the trip before Wolfgang finally spoke up. You know? You look like a shit to the shit. <laughs> Considering I'd been blown up and lost my best friend and probably about to die, his assessment could have been a lot worse. All I could say was, well, I, I didn't recognize anything around us. It was impossible that we got lost on the only road, and yet being impossible hardly seemed to stop anything else from happening today. The only thing I could do was chalk it up to my memory playing tricks on me again. How long has it been since it took my medicine? I must have been another mile down the road before Vulcan spoke again. How far do you think we have to be to not hear a gunshot from the house? In this weather, you could shoot someone dead at the end of the driveway and nobody would have been wiser. But I sure as hell wasn't about to tell him that. Don't worry. Gunshots are loud as hell. If somebody were to fire a gun, everyone would know. You little fucking Captain Obvious assholes. Up there so stupid. I kept pushing forward. The trees were so thick on either side of us that they looked like a solid wall in the dark. It's not right. I thought to myself. I remember. This was all farmland before. Much further looking wide. I'm not sure that car should be around here somewhere. I scanned the edges of the road for a stick or a rock or anything. I could feel like he lost his patience. He was getting ready to take a shot, and I didn't have anything to defend myself with. I don't think we walked this far, he said. I think someone has to move all the cars. Who would do something like that? I don't know. That makes sense. I stopped, turned to face him, and asked, How does that make sense? Think about it. Whoever's doing this has it down to a pattern. They must have had lots of practice. They probably have friends or workers who wait until we leave and then they come and they drive our cars to the scrap yard. They're good at this because they've done it so many times before. You're right. That does make sense. I said, even though it really didn't, I'm saying, if you don't seem all that worried, I've got a plan. Yeah? Yeah. When they come for me, I'll just kill them all. I turned around and started walking again. Hey, let's keep looking. Maybe our cars are a little further this way. I put some pep in my step, trying to create some distance between us, but Wolfgang was faster than me, and he kept up without any problem. You know what? He said. I think that's the secret ingredient. Practice. You need a little bit of practice, and you do anything you want. There was something up ahead. An interruption in the pattern, a driveway. For a moment, I thought it was safe. Wolfgang hadn't noticed me yet. He just kept talking. The mom always told me. She said I needed real-world experience and I could do whatever I wanted. As I got closer, I realized what was wrong with this driveway. I'd seen it before. The only mom left her room after the man told us to stay still. She wanted us to sneak away before the cops arrived. Want to know why? Because she thought I was the one who killed that old bitch. Mom thought she was protecting me. Really? She was controlling me. And then I saw my opportunity, and you know what I did? I took my knife, and Wolfgang! I shouted. He was grinning, holding the gun in his hand, eager to get more practice. What? Take a look. He pointed up to the driveway. He was so hyper-focused that he failed to realize where we were. We'd been walking for miles in a straight line, yet somehow we were standing back where we started at the entrance to Bedside Manor. He laughed. What's so funny? It doesn't matter, he said. I'm still gonna kill you. Then I'm gonna kill the sisters, and I'll kill anyone else who tries to fuck Yeah, come here for a minute. Cops arrive, I'll tell them. <laughs> My cell phone collides oh, with his face as hard as I can throw it. <laughs> gonna be tripped out. Right? I'm really good. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, oh, yeah. I'm taking advantage of a young psychopath's inexperience and running blindly towards the forest for cover. A second later, he let out a primal howl. The light from his phone cast my shrieking shadow against the trees, giving me just enough visual reference to slide between two giant trunks as he fired the first shot. He screamed again and rushed after me, firing wildly with no regard for ammo conservation. His light was the only source out here. The further I got, the harder it was to see. I tripped a few times, hit a few branches, then finally stopped. 
pushed myself against the closest tree and held my breath. He was still broadcasting his position like a total amateur, screaming, firing, but he obviously had no idea where I'd gone. I started to climb. The kid would never find me up here. Another shot rang out, much closer, and then I saw the light steadily growing brighter. Wolfgang was headed right for me, but he couldn't have known where I was, right? He didn't see me climb. Did he? I had the upper hand as long as I stayed still and didn't move. I mean, it's not like he was psychic, too, right? Oh, crap. Oh, shit, crap, dead, fuck! He is a psychic, too! He stepped into the clearing beneath my hiding tree and stopped. Hey, Jack, he called. If you come out now, I promise I'll put a bullet right into your brain. I know how to make it fast. I was gauging the possibilities of a surprise drop attack when I heard a noise. A low, rumbling growl emanating from somewhere deep in the forest. Wolfgang snapped his light in the direction of the sound. Jack? He said. Is that you? The growl had become louder, and then it split into multiples. A chorus of thunderous growls from every direction. He swung the gun and the light in a full circle and called out, Hey, who's there? The circle of sound began to shrink in us, becoming louder and closer. When the first creature appeared, it took all of my self-control not to scream. The thing was nearly as tall as Wolfgang. Bright red eyes, coal black fur, four legs, hackles raised, teeth bared, a nightmare hellhound. And steadily closing in on its prey, Wolfgang fired. The bullet landed in the animal's snout. But just like Nathaniel, the animal had no reaction to the injury. Stay back! Wolfgang screamed. I noticed the other hellhounds a second before he did. There were four of them now, boxing him in from every side. He spun and fired at another, catching it across the torso. But the monster didn't do so much as yip. He didn't get a third shot. The animals attacked all at once, tearing into him, ripping flesh from bone as he screamed in terror and agony. I closed my eyes. If I could have, I would have closed my ears too, but... But I had to listen. I had to listen to him wail as they devoured him alive. He dragged him off the woods. Sometime later, it's hard to say how much, but I was reasonably certain that I was already in the early to mid stages of hypothermia. I reopened my eyes. Much to my amazement, I could see my surroundings. The sun was already rising, and the storm clouds continued to blot out the sky. Enough light broke free to allow me to navigate back. I needed to get to Claire and Warren before they made the mistake of coming and looking for me. The rules of the game had quite unexpectedly changed again, and now there was pertinent information that needed to be factored into our survival plan. Wolfgang had been killed by a... I literally rolled my eyes as the thought hit me. Really funny who was in charge. Wolfgang was killed by a gang of wolves. The actual fuck. After carefully falling out of the tree onto my ass, I righted myself and started back towards the house. I took two steps and stopped and wondered, is this the right direction? I turned around and tried to remember which way I was running before I climbed the tree. In the panic of it all, I had forgotten to take visual references. Not that it really mattered considering how every tree looked exactly the same. I heard the growl just in time to run around and see the black wolf standing a couple yards away. Somehow it looked even more terrifying in the daylight. Eyes glowing red as hot embers, fur blacker than night, teeth on full display. Hey, buddy. I said in my calm voice. Look at you. Who's a good boy? You are. Thanks for the assist back there. You um, should be full by now, right? <laughs> I hit the ground before I even realized he pounced. I felt the full weight of the enormous creature pinning me down. I felt my ribs cracking like pretzels beneath his paws, stabbing my organs from the inside. The very last thing I felt was the searing, brutal pain of its teeth, dull but strong as they pierced around my throat, ripping out my windpipe. I couldn't scream. I couldn't fight. All I could do was die. Who touched that? Jerry screamed. There was a lot of screaming, actually, but Jerry was the only voice I could make out. The lights had snapped back on. The warmth had returned to my skin. The ringing in my ears and the blast had gone. We were all seated around the dining room table. We were all perfectly dry. Everyone was back in their period costumes. No cuts, scrapes, or bruises. Everything was, dare I say, normal. Tobias and Bridget jumped to their feet and embraced. Oak vomited onto her dinner plate. Wolfgang stared across the table at me, fury in his eyes. The voices continued over one another, fighting, screaming, crying. 
Eventually, Jerry whistled loud enough to make everyone shut up. He had the floor now. Everyone calm your collective tits. <laughs> Let me ask you one question. Did I just die? You died over an hour ago, Lauren said. Jerry put his hands on his hips, looked at Tobias and laughed. I fucking told you so. But you didn't die an hour ago, my carpenter. You died last night. You've been dead for so long. He looked at me, made a bemused face, and asked, Are you crying, dude? <coughs> I can't tell you why he would ask something like that. I, mean, I wasn't crying. And anybody who tries to tell you otherwise wasn't there and can't know what really happened and is probably just a big fat liar. Now, everyone, there was an audible gasp from several of us present as soon as the band no band speaking. It would appear that our night has gotten off to a strange stop. Fortunately, we have been given a second opportunity to solve the mystery of bedside matter. I recommend we do not squander it. Jerry picked up a dinner plate and frisbeed it across the table. It smashed into pieces across Nathaniel's face. The old man didn't react. Damn, Jerry said. I thought for sure that would prove that he wasn't really blind. I think it proves he isn't really human, corrected Lauren. Hope slapped the table with both hands and screamed, Will someone please tell me what's going on? Tobias asked. What's the last thing everyone remembers? Jerry answered. You didn't listen to me and got us killed. Lauren was next. We survived the explosion, but then Jack and Wolfgang left to find help, and then... She couldn't bring herself to finish the sentence, so Claire did it for her. You were killed by a haunted state of armor. Jerry nodded and said, Nice. What about you? Tobias asked, looking at her. The color drained from her face, and she turned and looked at her son. Oh, shit. She answered, I didn't think he did it. Wolfgang pointed across the table at me and shouted, He did! He's the one who killed me! Jerry couldn't contain himself. Oh, shut your butt, Wolfie. We're not idiots. We know you killed your mom. Don't speak that way about my son! Oh, shrieked. Your friend there is the one taking crazy pills! I snapped right back. And you're the lady who recognizes <laughs> antipsychotics by their drug names. Care to tell us why that is? Bias was kind enough to change the subject. Everyone hold on for a second. Am I to understand that we all just experienced our own deaths? And then we regain consciousness right here at the same time with no sign of injury whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Ah. Jerry responded. He looked around the table and asked, Hey, how come Maggie isn't here? Was there not enough fairy dust to bring everyone back? Maybe it's just a collective vision, Lauren offered. Maybe none of that really happened. I mean, how could it happen? The sound of a loud chime echoed through the house. What the hell was that? Jerry asked. Nathaniel answered with a smile. Ah, goody. Seems that the detective has finally arrived. Perhaps he can help us sort out this gas. Hey there, kids, and happy Halloween. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video. Or this week's tonight's episode, soon. this October Fest on the podcast. <sighs> if you're not listening on the podcast, and you always can listen on the podcast, that's Spotify, or just about anywhere you find a podcast. And if you're not listening on YouTube, then you can find it on YouTube, or just about anywhere you find your YouTube. I just want to remind all of you that if you're on a cold autumn night, and you need a warm drink. My wife sells tea. There's tea available at Etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. All different kinds, including those Ooh, horror icons. Yeah. I'm fine. Monsters and Dungeons and Dragons. And if you order that creepy pasta set with the Mr. Creepy Pasta's Dark and Stormy Night, the actual tea that I drink while recording these stories, uh, well, probably 60% of the time, then you can always ask for that MCP dabbing sticker instead of the classic channel. And I get a kick out of it every time someone asks for do that. Also, I wanted to say thank you, all of you who are supporting me on Patreon, patreon.com slash Mr. Pasta, 
If you ever want to help support the show, keep the lights on, feed my cats and the like, you can always head over to patreon.com slash Pasta, and you can support the show there. One dollar is greatly appreciated. And I have a very special thank you to these guys, such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mr. Thud, Ken Lando Higuchi, Chupinski, Nico Kyle, Tristan Felton, Stephen Van Huss, Chance Burnett, Deanna Krauss, G. Weevil 3, The Red Oak Shield Buyers, Corey Kenshin, Hothead Holmes, Rival 1, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Nels, The Village Witch, Hades Nephew, Jordan Wayne Deckard, Bradley Lipe, Anne Charm, Acid Sister, Mike Bullock, Fooly Cooly Dude, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation, Brian Arce, Cryptic Nightmares, Shadow Morningstar, Brianna Wright, Someone You Love, Sam the King 56, Bad Honey, S Man, Kiri the Sloth, Thomas Bergen, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Last Blade Song, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, and Aaron Stormcrow. And another thank you to all you guys who are in the description. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you all for listening. I hope you all have a wonderfully happy um, Sweet Dreams. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. PewDiePasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I want to tell you about the book that it's pulled from. This is... Okay. I need to wait till this dries, so I'm going to stop. Well, actually. find something else to watch or listen to while I work. Shoes are so comfortable and so stretchy, your child will be comfy all day long. Now at Sleep Out Better, oh, you up to $300 free with select mattress purchases. <sighs> you have something that you truly, relentlessly desire. Despite your state of mind, is there something else that you would go completely to the end of the world to get? Well, lucky for you. There's a way to achieve what you're looking for. You won't need to go to the end of the world to get it. But you won't need to go somewhere. And the place may be too out of reach for some. It's not far away, closer than one may believe. But there are requirements that some individuals may not know. First, whatever it is that you seek, know that you must seriously desire what you want. In your eyes, it should be something you need. 
If you begin the journey without the correct state of mind, you will surely fail, as it will be near impossible to turn back on the eternal state. The second requirement is that you will need a vehicle to use the mind. Some use it not, as it's the most comfortable choice. There have been a select few that have used small motorized vehicles, such as an ATV or motorcycle, but this has proven to be quite difficult, as the conditions of the journey are going to be Do not use a vehicle too large or noticeable, as you will need some of the cover of night to be able to see. Also, while any sort of car will do, you may not want to choose the most expensive or cherished vehicle. You can take your slick new black Mercedes for the drive if you like, but don't expect it to come out in pristine state. Make sure your vehicle is completely fueled before beginning the drive. The first task to accomplish is to locate the road. It doesn't have a name, it's not on the map, and technically, it doesn't even exist. It will only show up if you are looking for it anyway, and you will always find it if you know what you're looking for. Finally, you must be alone during the journey, if you think you'll be able to go with the group. You must be alone when you begin. Choose the time of night when you believe the roads are the least Drive to any area that is just a stretch of road surrounded by roads. Here is where you want to start to follow the basic motion. If you're looking for the road, you can turn up eventually, but you need to search for the roads to come in order to find the road. Once you're close, you'll see the feeling of signs. What the signs will be will depend on what it is you desire. For example, if you search for well, you may spot shivers on the empty branches of trees, as if they resemble the shine of the glory of the animals. If you see blood, you may begin to see rose petals flying pants on the light wheels, whirling in the Lord's direction. If you see revenge, you might sense an ever growing appeal of heat or anger in your body as you approach. Just know what it is you really want, and you'll have no problem coming. Once you're sure you found the revealed world, take a deep breath and turn down on to it. At this point, you have officially started down the nameless road which brings you through the level of the leading to whatever it is you see. Each mile will test your desire and will expose what you really do want to be searching for. Slowly go further, set the car, and be wary of any advisor. Do not turn on a radio during the drive. Do not use a phone during the drive. Reception would be cut off now. Do not open the windows during the drive. Make sure they're closed. Amazing. If you're riding a vehicle without windows or a top, then prepare for the worst, as the odds are heavily against you. Do not attempt to leave your vehicle at any time. You'll never want to exceed 30 miles per hour unless you're desperate to make it to the section. <laughs> the most important one, as with any drive, buckle up. Feel free to prepare and make sure you're ready. Once the road has been entered, time has stopped so you don't need to worry about losing the road. Well, you may not know. You're not actually in your own world anymore. Take one last moment to realize that once the first mile is over, there is no turning back. If you ponder turning back again, Know that you shouldn't even be on a journey in the first place. Once all is done, you'll turn around the road. On the first mile, you won't see much change. The road passes through mostly woods, with a few miles being an exception. The air will turn a bit colder, and which you should turn on your own system if you're here from Martin. You won't want to take your eyes off the road either. Thanks for trying to turn on any uneasiness. By admiring some of the night sky. You will see it completely lined with stars, more than what you would ever believe possible. If the weather was cloudy before, you'll also notice the sky is quite cold. On the second mile, the air will become even colder. This is primarily the reason why traveling in an open vehicle is very difficult. For each mile, the air will drop in temperature, even if the season should be warm. If the air is too cold to bear, even with the your only option is to speed up. 
the beach below. The road also becomes more compact, taking more turns and showing an increasing amount of road hazards. Be sure to always keep black on the road in front of you, in order to avoid as many bumps or obstacles as possible. Hitting a few rocks and potholes won't help your progress too much, but you'll want to keep the best condition for as long as possible. If your vehicle is forced to stop because of damage, then there's nothing left you can do but eventually freeze to death. On the third line, you may begin to spot silhouettes of human figures in the line of the trees. Pay no attention to them, even if they seem to get closer. It will be hard to resist peeking at their unnerving distant appearance. If not, they will reveal themselves later. At this mile, the road will become dirt if you weren't driving on it in the beginning. Keep to the center of the path as it will become narrow and wide at random intervals. On a quick side note, should you ever attempt to turn around, despite the previous warning, you will be left on a path which you never knew. You would simply run out of fuel eventually and be left to flee in the cold conditions. On the fourth line, you will not only see more of the figures, but you will begin to, in a sense, hear them. In the back of your mind, a very faint, unintangible whisper will echo. These will come and go, but you can't stop them. If they become bothersome or distracting, try and turn them out by thinking of what it is you desire, attempting to listen and determine what the voice is you say. Only attract them to you. And you want to be as far away from them as you can. They'll be close to you, but there's no new screen in the meantime. <sighs> On the fifth line, you will come to a clearing. The lighting of trees to your left will disappear to reveal a lake. There's no end. It reveals the great moon of the world. The illumination of the moon will be so spectacular that the vehicle's headlights will no longer be required. Restrain yourself from gazing at it. If you look at its lights for even more than a few seconds, the road in front of you will end, throwing your vehicle into the water in which you will flee. The voices will be drawn into this moment. But don't be joyous just yet. They'll be back. On the sixth line, take into account that you are more than halfway done. Despite the progress, you may lose hope. The stars will have disappeared at this point, leaving the sky and empty black abyss. The clearing will have ended, leading you back into the woods. The only light you will have will be provided by your vehicle's headlights. If they are taken from the time you are not too sure, then it will be perfect for the night. If you have a radio in the vehicle, it will turn on here automatically. If you didn't turn it on beforehand, it will produce an overwhelming screech that will send you off the path. A calm voice will then begin to speak about your greatest fears. What it is you are horrified of in your head. It will speak in a way that will cause you to visualize the words in your mind. So don't listen to it. And if you begin to comprehend what it is said, the horrors will prove too much for you to say on the road safely. Attempting to turn off the radio will prove no use. Speed up if you need to. Just keep your mind off the radio as much as you can. As you approach the end of the line, your voice will fade out of the speakers. This is fucking weird. Really For now, on the seventh mile, the voices from the distance will return. They won't sound like a whisper this time, but you'll have a distant scream growing closer each second. At some point in this moment, you will hear one of them in your ear, as if one of them is right behind you. This is because one of the figures is on the way with you to you. Don't turn around. Their faces will shock you with growls, leading you off the road. If you don't draw attention to it, it will become and hopefully flee. These beings are said to be ones who have traveled down this road before, but were not. They live the remainder of their existence, suffering in the darkness, with their only goal being to bring other travelers down the road. It's been said from experience that these beings can't physically move, 
as long as they don't cause you to. You should be fine. Maybe if you're going to the house. The road will take some really short turns, which, if you don't stop, will throw the vehicle into a pit through the trees. The cold of food is not fatal. If you were to have a glass or bottle of liquid in your vehicle, it would be solid in seconds. The heating system will be completely obsolete. Your headlights will flicker more. Sometimes, I don't know, for a few seconds. You should break if this happens, but do not completely stop. The figures will be following you at this point, but should you stop for too long, they will also come and stop your vehicle. Or the same trap will be heard from outside of your doors, sometimes even sounding with maniacal laughter. The hands will cross your own steps, which will be turned into a fucking river. Do not look at them. They won't walk through the shield, and the last thing that you want to happen is to crash and be trapped with them. If you don't make it, on the ninth mile, your vehicle is stalled. The headlights will shut off, as will all other systems inside. There's nothing you can do to prevent them. What you will need to do is close your eyes and immediately attempt to restart the vehicle. Keep your eyes closed as the figures will assure you to The starting of the vehicle will frighten you, and they will all back away from the world. This will give you a chance to start moving forward. Okay. If you begin to hear the windows crack in their struggle, do not lose focus. The beings can alter the vehicle, but remember that they still do not have the strength to physically affect you. You will hear nothing but their voices rampaging in and there could be anywhere. <sighs> Once you start to hit the floor, well, not so long as you can stay on the path. When the mile's done, on the tenth mile, the voices of the beings will stop. If you were to look to your rear view mirror, perhaps you did, you will see them following you, but not as if they are chasing you. They're watching you. As if they are watching you. As if you go down the tenth mile, the road will be sweeping. If you go back on the first mile, the big guys will be lining the sides of the path. They won't be out here. They won't be watching you. Some fear I am being very impressive. That you have come a long way on the camera's side. Boy, boy, this is boy. They are not impressed, but they are impressed. They are happy that you're about to approach their tomorrow. They are happy. Because you are most likely going to your death. On the left, As it did on the last one. The vehicle would normally be immobile, but you are still immobile. An unknown force will be pulling you forward. In the darkness, you will see a glowing red light up ahead, as if it were a light at the end of the tunnel. Close your eyes and cover them. Do whatever it takes to make sure you do not see what you're about to go through. Covering your eyes would also be helpful. But keeping your eyes covered should also be a higher priority. The red light is another clarity, but there's no moon or lake this time. Once it's entered, unrelenting and inconceivable noises will sound from all directions. No amount of bravery and conditioning will spare you from these sounds. The cold will turn to a merciless heat, burning all parts of the vehicle. You will feel the illusion of the flesh being burned off of your bones, that every part of you is being destroyed as you travel through the screams and audible suffering. As long as you keep your eyes closed and resist the urge to see where you are, you will survive through the suffering. This will last a total of 31 seconds, but many fail to keep their vision closed during that time. And are left the worst fate of the world. When it was this mile left, those who will survive some have named the transmission. But whether it is part of her is debated. After the final one, power will return. Stop the vehicle. Take a moment to possibly regain some of your sanity. 
Let the screaming in your ears begin to fade and know that you have nearly completed your journey with the hardest task overcome. Breathe and begin to drive forward. After only a kilometer, your vehicle will arrive at a dead end. Stop here and don't attempt to move again. Nothing will happen like this second. Do not be disappointed. Relax. Close your eyes. Imagine in your mind what it is you desire this entire time. You will most likely still be disappointed. But in some, this desire may actually change the man. Think about what it is that you went through. Terrifying and difficult news to acquire and imagine possessing it in your hand. Once you completely visualize this slowly open your eyes, and you find yourself at the beginning of the unnamed world where you first began. This may confuse you, but know that you're finished. Your task is done. Your mind will turn to the world. If what you desired was material, check in the back seat or in the trunk if the object is larger. If the object is small enough, it may already be in your pocket. If what you desired was not material, then do not be disappointed that the change is not needed. Turn back to where you came from. And you'll find the meaning. And what you want is there. You may have found the love of your dreams. You may have gained unnatural, unimaginable power. You may have put your most the most satisfying advantage possible. You will have no doubt gaining what you do. So now that the task is done, look for cash. Is your vehicle close? Is there something you're about to lose? Is your death imminent? The answer to all is no, of course. You've done what you want. You've proved worthy of what you desire. As stated before, the sounds of the 11th mile will continue to exist in your mind, potentially causing you some vivid and unusual nightmares. But these should prove that you have been able to Are you not yet satisfied? You left like that. The road's right. This is a set of instructions for how to speak with the devil. Which, as those of you with any sort of brains at all might note, is a potentially moronic proposition on the face of it. One likely to culminate in any form of thoroughly unpleasant fates. Honestly, you'd probably be smarter to publish your credit card number on Facebook or take up a career in crocodile wrestling. <laughs> That isn't going to stop you, is it? Not if you're sincerely interested, at least. Technically, if you do everything just right, there's a fair chance that you'll walk away scot free. And that seems to be reason enough for some people to decide that it's a good idea, especially if you are the fake tempting, thrill seeking, scare junkie type. 
for the desperate time. <sighs> Which brings me to a point of clarification I want to make. This is not a menu for making any kind of Faustian bargain. You know, the whole sell your soul type of deal. Although if you happen to bring it up in conversation, he certainly wouldn't be one to refuse. Following through with such a cool party bargain, however, would necessitate removing some of the protection which would put in place your conversation. And I don't think I need to spell out for you why that would be a bad idea. If you're really mathematically impaired enough to want to trade something that will last an infinite number of years for something that might last about 90 tops, there are plenty of other rituals out there for you to follow. This one, if you perform it correctly, should allow the two of you to talk. This perhaps begs the question of why exactly would you want to speak with the devil in the first place? Maybe some of you just like the idea of making small talk with extremely dangerous occult entities, but for the sake of the human race, I hope most of you aren't quite that stupid. <laughs> for that's right. He knows things. Things that some of you may have a deep vested interest in finding out. I mean, he's not omniscient or anything. Much as he might like to pretend otherwise. He's not God. But he's definitely got a supernatural advantage over the kind of knowledge any human would be able to find. For example, he probably wouldn't be able to predict when the next world war will happen. Or tell you the cure for cancer. And he could very well be able to predict the winning numbers for tomorrow's $500 million Powerball run. Tell you what deadly, undiagnosed condition might be afflicting one of your loved ones. Of course, the Prince of Darkness doesn't go around giving out winning lottery numbers to anybody who asks, and trusting any sort of information obtained <laughs> from <laughs> being commonly described as the father of all lies is liable to land you in a worse situation than you were when you started. However, I really did set my plan for you now. And you've exhausted all the options. There is a way to try to get accurate information about you. You see, like so many of the most urbane villains in popular culture, the devil has a passion for gain. Yeah. Of course, the reason that he likes them so much is that he almost always wins. Unless, that would be a bit of an age Johnny. We're being represented by Daniel Webster. But if you're determined enough to want to face the risks and the long odds, there's a certain game the two of you can play to try to win the information you need. First things first, though. We'll start off with a description of the summoning process, then get into the rules of the game, some tips on how to play, and finally, of course, the inevitable litany of arcane shit. That goes horribly, horribly wrong. In other words, in order to contact your conversational partner, you'll need to go to church at midnight. It doesn't matter what kind of church, large or small, old or new, liberal or conservative. Just as long as you're sure that you'll be empty. The next thing you want is for some creature to walk in on you while you're in the middle of this, for the sake of the creature's well being as much as your own. The process will probably work best if you try it on a new moon or full moon. Friday the 13th or Halloween. The actual day is less important than the psychological effect that it has on you. As long as you don't try it on Christmas Eve or something stupid like that, you should be fine. The time is important. You don't have to start or end your ritual exactly 12 a.m. Greenwich atomic time or anything, but there's a general rule of thumb. You want to show up a bit fully at night. You have everything set up. I know later than to up a lot before midnight if you don't know how you're going to get it. Shockingly enough, most houses of God do tend to lock their doors at night. At least, no one's there to watch over them. You want empty. Got it? There are, of course, certain things that you need to bring, and certain things that you can't bring. For this ritual, you will need a whole can of salt. You won't need to use all of it. It's always better to have more than you need and have less. Seven candles, red or white, be preferred. Something to light the candles with. 
You'd be shocked how often people forget this. Occult ritual or not, they aren't going to be magically like themselves. A length of red string, rope, yarn, or thread. A full length floor or wall mirror. Ideally, you'll want to find one of those already present in the church. They're a bit unwieldy to be walking around with you during a break in. However, if there really aren't any there, then you'll have to bring your own. You might also find it useful to bring some markers, pencils, paper, a flashlight, any sort of tools that might be necessary to secure your entrance into the church. You will not be permitted to bring in any electronic or timekeeping device. This includes all cell phones, smartphones, tablets, e readers, MP3 players, PDAs, calculators, wristwatches, pocket watches, kitchen timers, hourglasses, etc., etc., etc. Seriously, worse than the NCT. If you're one of those people that has your smartphone practically wired into your brain, don't worry. You can bring those things with you to the church as long as you leave them outside the room in which you'll be doing the ritual. You'll be brought a flashlight, helpful for finding your way around while, without contracting unwanted attention. Leave that outside too. Also, don't bring any sort of religious paraphernalia to protect you especially if it pertains to the Abrahamic religions. And yes, if those gothy black cross earrings that you're wearing are hanging right side up, they can't. If you have any kind of holy symbol like that with you, the devil will simply refuse to show up. Don't worry, you're not going in totally unprotected. In fact, most of the supplies with you are not for any sort of devil summoning ritual. For your own protection. All superstitions and folk magic are these to guard yourself. What I know of it, the effects mostly based on your power of belief. So, there are probably numerous other objects, artifacts, and procedures that will work just as well. If you'd like to risk being left helpless at the mercy of the devil in order to test that theory, feel free to experiment. However, with anyone without a psychotic death wish, I'd recommend sticking to the ritual that's followed. Once you're sure. You have all the right supplies with you. Make your way to the church and find some place to set up. It can be anywhere from the main sanctuary where services are held to a Sunday school classroom to a walk-in supply closet. As long as you have a sufficient amount of open floor space, and you're certain you have to be straight. Set up your mirror first. This is where the devil will appear when you summon him. As such, you mustn't as such, you must complete the summoning. Please lay down certain boards around you. First, surround the mirror with an unbroken circle of foam. If the mirror is hanging on a wall or floor, lay down a semicircle around it instead. Make sure that the salt touches the wall at both ends. I think that's good for tonight. And you have to string around the mirror several times. The color red, a specifically red string, is symbolic of protection in the folklore of many cultures and religions. This is also why red candles are a good idea. 